Thanks. So this is joint work with Lila Fonts, Jordanus Karenidis and Mathieu Lauriard, who are with me at DFA at Université Paris Diderot in Paris, and also Raoul Jane at National University of Singapore and Jérémy Roland in um, Brussels. So in this talk, we're going to consider the question about whether information complexity is equal to communication complexity. So you've heard a talk about this yesterday, and maybe you're wondering why I'm standing here since the problem has been solved. So we'll get to that in a moment. So in communication complexity, the setting is the following. Uh, we have two players who each have part of the input, and they want to solve some function or some problem that depends on both of the inputs. And we're going to define communication complexity as the smallest amount of information that they have to exchange in the worst case input um, in order to solve this with some error probability, which might be up to an epsilon fraction. So in the standard model of communication complexity, one would consider uh, correctness to be required for all the inputs x, y. So for every x, y, you should have correctness um, at least 1 minus epsilon. Um, however, you might also consider what happens if you have a prior distribution on the inputs. So if you have an in a distribution on the inputs, maybe some of the inputs are not so frequent, and you might allow for them to have a little bit more than epsilon error, just as long as on average over the distribution, the, the, the probability of having an error is bounded by epsilon. So I just want to point out that for the for purpose of this talk, we're just going to be talking about Boolean functions, and we're also going to allow shared randomness between the players for free. So Yao's theorem, um, the min-max theorem that probably everybody is very familiar with, says that the communication complexity uh, is equal to taking the worst distribution of the inputs and looking at the distributional complexity for that fixed worst case distribution. Uh, somebody, a friend of mine, sent me this cartoon um, after hearing about what I was working on. This is a non specialist who thought this was very funny. <laughs> so she says there, she says there, there's some conversations that bear a lot more bits of information than they actually communicate, as in this case. And this is the question of whether, you know, can you compress conversations so that each bit that you speak actually bears information. So we need to measure what we mean by information in a conversation, and we'll use internal information complexity. Um, so you can define it with respect to a prior distribution mu on the inputs, and what you're going to be looking at informally is how much information how much information does Bob learn about Alice's input given the transcript of the conversation that took place, plus the amount of information that Alice learns, so Alice knows x, and she wants to know we want to know how much information she learns about Bob's input given the, trans the transcript of the conversation that took place. And now if you want to talk about information complexity in a non-distributional sense, so you want to you know, average weight, we would take the worst possible distribution, then you would take, again, the max over mu, maybe this is the super over mu, of the information complexity with respect to a specific distribution. Now, it's a big open question whether information complexity is equal to communication complexity, and again, you might be asking, didn't we just solve this yesterday? But first, why are we interested in this question? So if we gave a positive answer, I mean, there's many motivations. One of them is just a, a theoretical motivation. It's kind of nice to know if you can do compression in the interactive setting, so without errors for this particular case. Um, uh, but also, the nice thing about information complexity is that it has direct sum property. It means if you have k instances of a problem, then it was going, it's going to require at least k times the amount, of commun the amount of information in order to solve um, one instance, in order to solve the k instances. So we would like for this to be true for communication complexity. At the moment, if you have a function and you want to show such a property, then you have to either prove a lower bound on, on um, information complexity and show that it's tight, and then you get this direct sum property, or you just have to work very hard to get it ad hoc, using ad hoc methods. And if we had this theorem, then we would just get it for free for all communication complexity. So this talk is about how could we go about proving or disproving this conjecture about information complexity versus communication complexity. 
And imagine you would like to show that communication complexity is in fact at most the information complexity, so you can compress to the information content. Then you would need to have, or unless somebody comes up with a, with a more circuitous way of doing it, you would have to come up with a way to compress any protocol to its information complexity. So take a, a communication protocol and you, you would want to be able to change this protocol in such a way that you don't have any wasteful bits of communication that are not conveying any information. Um, on the other hand, if you'd like to separate them, then you'd like to find a function or a task in the more general setting, ideally a total Boolean function if you could, where um, you could show that the information complexity is very small by giving a protocol and analyzing it. And on the other hand, you'd have to show that the communication complexity is very high. And for this, you need strong lower bound techniques. Um, so at the moment, the best result is the one that I've put on the bottom of the slide. Um, so why are we still here after yesterday's talk? So what we saw yesterday is an exponential gap between information communication for a fixed distribution mu. So the, the, the distribution is tailored very delicately in order to get the information complexity be, to be low. Um, how, how important is this distribution and how, how fragile is the, the result to the specific distribution? Um, well, we're, that's the question that we wanted to ask. Um, is the technique that they used sufficient to prove a separation in the non-distributional case? So let's just take a look at the quantifiers and the directions of the inequalities here. What we would like to show is a separation, so one possible answer that we would like to, be, to go after, is we want to know if the information complexity is, about, is less than the communication complexity for any function, uh, for, for the specific function f, which is the same as saying that for the worst mu, the information complexity is less than the communication complexity for the worst mu. Now notice that these different maximums can be attained for different distributions mu. Right, so what could happen? Well, here, the communication complexity can only go up, so this part can only become worse in terms, I mean, the separation can only become worse. But the problem is here, if you take a different distribution mu, the information complexity might jump up. And, well, let's see what happens. So again, I'm coming back to if you wanted to give a separation, you need a strong communication complexity lower bound. Um, it's a jungle out there. There's a, a, a tremendous number of different communication complexity lower bound techniques that have been develop, developed over the years. Most of you are probably familiar with the discrepancy bound or the rectangle bound, also called the, the corruption bound. Um, but in recent years, there's been many other methods that have been developed to prove that communication complexity problems are hard. Um, some recent developments, there is an approximate positive rank, which was recently shown for Boolean functions. So again, I'm being a little casual here with this, this picture. One has to be um, a little bit specific about these small um, details, like whether the function is a Boolean function, a total Boolean function. So some of these results only hold for total Boolean functions. Means? So the arrows mean that um, for example, here that the partition bound is uh, greater than or equal to the relaxed partition bound for any function. So actually here I'm cheating a little bit because the, part, the partition bound is scaled exponentially bigger than the communication complexity. Um, but what it means is that for any function f here, for example, the communication complexity is at least as large as the information complexity up to constant uh, multiplicative, multiplicative factors. Okay, so let's just go through some of this, these, the trees in this jungle. So we've got the, oh, and also I should mention that um, the mapping out of this forest was initiated, or not entirely, but a lot of the work was done by Jane and Clauck in a paper in 2010, where they gave linear programs for many of these um, lower bound techniques and then compared them um, when pair by, by, or two by two. So we get this kind of a hierarchy. Um, so this is the rectangle bound, the smooth rectangle bound, the discrepancy, the smooth discrepancy, which is equivalent to the gamma two norm-based method, 
Um, we have the partition bound, which is a lower bound on communication complexity. Um, and then in 2012, um, with some co-authors, we showed that the, a, 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 relaxa or, or, um, a modification, a slight modification of the partition bound was actually a lower bound on the information complexity, um, which meant that if you want to separate information from communication, none of these techniques are going to, are going to do the job for you because the, these will always give you not just a lower bound on the communication complexity, but also on the in information complexity. So, so if we want to, so, or, sorry? So only partition bound can... At the moment, um, so we'll, I'll get back to that a little bit later if I have time at the end of the talk, but at the mo moment, it seems like only the partition bound is a candidate. Um, unfortunately, the partition bound, um, we don't really know how to use it. Uh, there's kind of a trade-off that goes on here. Like, we would, why, why don't we just always use a partition bound to prove lower bounds? It's because it's kind of tough to manage. You have to, to fine-tune a lot of variables, and you have to, you know, you, you have to find the correct way to get this to be large. Whereas, you know, we have a better intuition for the discrepancy and the rectangle bounds, and we're able to actually prove lower bounds using those techniques. But computing the partition bound, okay, it is a linear program, but, but most of us would like a solution that works for any, any input length, and so it's, um, it's less tractable. Um, yeah. So in this, uh, in this talk that we saw yesterday, um, they propose a new method, which is called the relative discrepancy. And they show that for a fixed distribution, you can get a separation here. So the relative discrepancy is going to be, is gonna, it gives a lower bound on the communication complexity, so the relative discrepancy is large for this function and for this distribution, and the information complexity for this, for this function and this distribution is small. This is what they show. They have an exponential gap there. Okay, so but in this picture, which is more like a non-distributional picture, um, I'd like to see where this relative discrepancy sits. <clears throat> so that's going to be the first part of the talk is we're going to try to see where the relative discrepancy sits with respect to the other, in the non-distributional setting. Um, and then for me, what gets, where, where it gets maybe a little technical, but, but a lot more interesting in terms of, you know, what, what are these methods doing and how do they compare to one another? And maybe it gives us an idea of where the, the crux of the problem lies in proving this information complexity versus communication complexity is exactly where relative discrepancy sits relative to the distributional versions of all of these lower bounds. So, for example, the partition bound and the relaxed partition bound. Um, I mean, the partition bound in, in Jane and Klauk's paper is, is given in a non-distributional fashion. But you can give a distributional analog of it. Um, relaxed partition, um, um, so this upper bound holds also relative to fixed distributions mu. So, so what's interesting for me is um, what happens in this more fine-grained setting where the distributions are fixed. Just a question about your terminology. When you say the distributional version, it means... Distributional means distribution. fixed for... for a sp okay. So distributional means for fixed distribution. Non-distributional means worst-case distribution. Yeah. Any questions? So, um, well, this gives it away. So, what we show in this paper is that the relative discrepancy, when you're not when you're not fixing the distribution, in fact, sits below the information complexity, and we show that by showing that it sits below the relaxed partition bound. So the relaxed partition bound will always give you at least as strong a bound as the relaxed discrepancy, and the information complexity gives you at least as strong, is at least as large as the relative, as the relaxed partition bound. So I still haven't told you what these things mean, so let's maybe go into it now for a few moments. Um, basically, at this point, I've, I've conveyed the message that I wanted to convey, like the, the main, the big picture. Um, and I don't want to go into the technical details, but I would like to try to give you some intuition about what these methods are doing, how to use them, and, um, and what they're measuring.
So maybe the authors in this room can, can tell me if they agree with my, my intuition about the relative discrepancy. So you're probably familiar with the discrepancy method for communication complexity lower bounds. Basically what you're saying is you have a communication protocol. It breaks down your inputs into rectangles and you assign to each rectangle just one output. And um, relative discrepancy, so discrepancy says if, you, if your rectangles are large enough, then they're going to have high discrepancy, meaning that it's going to have roughly half zero answers and half one answer. And the correct answer is going to be divided about half and half in every large enough rectangle. Now, this is what this is representing, this picture here. So we have a communication rectangle. So this is at the end of your protocol. You're going to out, just give one answer for this, these inputs for, of Alice and these inputs of Bob. And um, what you want to argue is that for every large enough rectangle, the proportion of correct answers z equals zero should be about half, which means that if your protocol is going to be correct, the rectangles are going to have to be small. Otherwise, you're going to have too much error. Okay. So what does the relative discrepancy do relative to discrepancy? is that it allows you to account for the fact that in, in maybe, uh, so the size of the rectangle is measured according to your distribution mu. And perhaps, so I think, for example, one, one case where you would want to, to um, move away from discrepancy and go towards relative discrepancy is that you have lots of different sizes of rectangles and you might want to rescale them so they're all similar size, for example. So here, in, the discrepancy would not be high enough in this rectangle, so I'm going to, to rescale a little bit this, the, the size of the rectangle, but not rescale the size of the zero part of the rectangle. And then, then this would still have you know, the, the desired amount of discrepancy. So it gives you a little bit more wiggle space to establish the discrepancy if your function is not exactly as well behaved as you'd like. Now let's move on to the partition bound and the relaxed partition bound. Um, Raul is not in the room, so he, might, he has probably a different intuition for what this partition bound is measuring. But my personal intuition um, is an operational intuition. Let's, let's see how it goes. So we want to show that it's hard to compute a function with a small amount of communication. So assume we do have a protocol which, which does compute it with C bits of communication, and it computes it epsilon correctly. So this is the non-distributional version of the partition bound. Then I claim that there has to be a, a, a communication protocol that doesn't communicate, so zero communication protocol. It's going to make a lot of mistakes, right? If I remove entirely the communication, something has to give. I can't be correct by removing the communication. But what am I going to pay for this removal of the communication? I'm going to allow the, the players to, to say, sorry, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not able to give an answer in this case. And the, the probability with which they're able to give an answer is going to be related to the communication complexity in the following way. So just briefly, how would we sketch such a proof? So we have start with the communication protocol and then remove the communication entirely. So what can they do? I mean, they, they're not communicating anymore. How can they possibly solve the problem? But they have access to shared randomness. So what might we suggest so that with some small probability they're actually able to solve the problem? Let's guess the transcript of the conversation. Now, locally, each of the players can look at this guess transcript and decide whether they agree with it or not. And if they don't agree with the, this, this random guess, then they just say, sorry, just throw up their hands in despair and say, no, can't, can't play. But with probability, one over the number of possible transcripts that might have taken place, they are going to answer and they are going to be able to follow the protocol. They're able to output according to the protocol. So what is the partition bound measuring? Well, it's measuring the best efficiency that you can achieve for any zero communication protocol. And we know that you can achieve one over two to the C if you have a C bit 
communication protocol. But there might be, there might be other, right? So this is not measuring communication complexity, it's measuring something a little bit weaker. There's a very important constraint here is that this, what I call this efficiency, the rate at which you actually answer something, this has to be equal for every x, y. And it turns out that this is a very important constraint, this equality of aborting. And the difference between the partition bound and the relaxed partition bound is that you relax this condition of having to abort at the same rate for every x, y. And this seems like a, like why would this matter? Um, uh, well, it matters because if you take the relaxed partition bound, it's a, it's a, it's a lower bound on information complexity. And if you require that the abort rate be constant, then, well, now we know that it's not, it, it cannot be a lower bound on information complexity for some functions because we have a counterexample with a bursting noise function. Could you say, I, I, I'm happy to say that again. What would, well, I don't quite get this. Um, how does the role of being able to vary the abort rate Oh. So that, that's in um, when we, we proved that the information complexity is bounded below by the relaxed partition bound. We're able to prove that there are zero communication protocols that abort at almost a constant rate, but we're not able to show that we can get a zero communication protocol that aborts at a constant rate, where the rate, instead of being related to the communication, is related to the information complexity. And just that, that seems to, that's where it breaks down, is in this, this constants or non-constants of the abort rate. Does it have to do with the fact that information is an average case? Now? That's what I think, yeah. So it's, okay. That's, that's my feeling, is that there's an average thing going on. So if you want to prove a lower bound using um, the partition bound, what do you do? Well, if you want to give an upper bound on the partition bound, which is not really what you want to do, usually you want to prove a lower bound on the partition bound. Um, if you want to prove an upper bound, it's easy because you just have to give, just provide me with an efficient zero communication protocol, analyze the efficiency, show that it's constant, um, and then you're done. You have an upper bound on the, efficient, on the partition bound. But if you want to give a lower bound, then you, you have a for all statement. You have to show that any um, zero communication protocol requires a high abort rate. And this is much more difficult. So we tend to look at the dual. Because these you can write as linear programs, all of the constraints that I've given, the, the error probability, so on. All of these can be written as linear constraints. And um, the dual changes the uh, min max into the max min or the other way around. and it, it gives you a more suitable formulation to prove lower bounds. Now, I'm afraid I would love to give you intuition on how to use this dual formulation of the, of the partition bound, but I don't have a very good intuition about it. Um, you, what you want to do is you want this beta of xy is sort of measuring the number of rectangles, and you're taking away something that has to do with the correctness. Okay, so think of beta of xy as 2 to the c, where c is the communication bound that you're trying to get. Um, and here, well, you know, it looks a little bit like a discrepancy because you're looking at, at the measure of a rectangle in this, like, it's not a distribution, right? So it's not going to be something between 0 and 1. It's going to be something between... Just say the word, uh, alpha and beta are defined uh, it, entry-wise, and this beta, beta is just the sum of the... Uh, yeah, so this is, exactly, this is the sum of all the xy's in... Of, over all of the inputs. So again, I'm neglecting a lot of information. Like if you have a partial function, then this, these sums get a little bit changed. You have to be careful about where the function is defined, where the function is not defined. I'm just doing it for total Boolean functions here. So what, do you, what would you like me to? So it's an optimization problem. It's a linear program. And if you want to find the partition bound for a function f, you need to find um, you need to find values, so you have variables, alpha, for every pair of inputs, x and y. You need to find values for, in, for um, these, the variables beta for every x and y. 
And then here are some constraints for the alphas and the betas that you've just proposed. It has to satisfy that for every rectangle, the sum of the betas in that rectangle minus the sum of the alphas in the, um, so z is an input, is an output of the function, so say z equals zero. Um, so the zero part of the rectangle, um, where, when you sum all of the alphas for that, the, just the zero part of the rectangle, this should be close to one. This should be less than or equal to one. So you propose alpha and beta, and um, and then you and then you can. Range of alpha and beta? Uh, they're just uh, so alpha x y's are non-negative reals. Betas can be negative. Betas can be negative. This is important, and we'll see in a moment in the last two minutes why. Okay. So the, there's a difference of scale. The communication complexity is at least the log of the partition bound. The partition bound is kind of measuring number of rectangles. So, so this beta is going to be something like the number of rectangles. All right, and this is going to be, with respect to this, this weighting scheme beta, the size of the rectangle and the alpha size of the <coughs> z part of the rectangle. And what's okay. the role of this of epsilon here? Is epsilon is the error. It's an error parameter. So it's how much, if you want a lower bound on the epsilon error communication complexity, irrespective of, di of distribution. So beta can't be more than one, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. These numbers are big. They're going, they're ranging up to two to the C, more or less. No, it, it can be huge. Right? Oh, it can be huge. Uh, it's, it's, it's different from the discrepancy in the sense that discrepancy, everything is normalized. You're talking about... Okay. If you take, like, on the on rectangle of size, of size one, that if beta is more than one, that it's going to fail this condition. So, so the individual betas are going to be. But the alpha can offset. No, but they, they can be anything, right? But this, this, this is going to be zero. Zero, right? So. This this is going to be zero. No, this is going like. Beta is bound. Beta, this this makes it clear that beta is bounded above by one. Really. For each individual point, yeah. Okay. That's true. I thought you meant this this uh, yeah. this beta over everything. The beta over everything is going to be two to the c, but locally it's it's going to be ha it's going to have to be less than one. Okay. So the relaxed partition bound. Now I I told you what the relaxed partition bound was in the sort of the primal scheme, and I told you that it's a matter of the equality constraint being so the the efficiency being approximately equal for all inputs. And how does this translate? In the, um, in the dual is you get this constraint, alpha xy minus beta xy positive. So I'm running out of time, so let me cut to the chase. How do we prove that the relative discrepancy is always less than the relaxed partition bound? Well, we take any solution to the, relaxed, the relative discrepancy, that is a distribution mu and a distribution rho, and we show that we can come up with a better solution to the relaxed uh, partition bound. So I'm not going to bore you with this change of variables, but what's important in this change of variables is to notice these following two points. So the first is that the beta is playing the, is playing the role of rho, this rescaling of the rectangles. And mu, mu's role is played by, um, I, it, again, mu is, is normalized, rho is normalized, but alpha and beta are not. And they're scaled by this factor one over delta here, which is one over the discrepancy, if you want to think about it that way. Okay. So they're on a different scale, but alpha minus beta corresponds to mu, and beta corresponds to rho. Why am I telling you this? Um, because this plays an important role when we want to really pin down what is the, you know, how the relative discrepancy compared, compares to the partition-based methods. So this is what this change of variable shows, is that we can always find a better solution to the relaxed partition bound um, from a solution to the relative discrepancy if you can change the distribution mu, right? If, if mu is not fixed. Where things get interesting, interesting is that when the distribution mu is fixed, well, I told you that the role of alpha was played by mu. I mean, alpha is just a scaled version of the distribution mu. So when you want, if you look at the, at the distributional version of the partition bound, this is exactly how it looks. That here we had alpha, and now we have, instead of alpha defined on every x, y, alpha is just like a scaling factor with respect to mu. All right? It's just a scalar. And 
it's multiplied always by mu. So this is the part that stays constant. So this change of variable is not going to go through anymore, which makes sense, right? Because it, it's not possible that it goes through since we have a separation in the distributional case. And I just showed you that you could not have a separation in the non-distributional case. And so something has to fail in our proof. And this is where it fails because we're not able to keep, um, so we're not able to keep alpha proportional to mu in the optimal solution. So let me just quickly go through what happens in the, for, in the fixed distribution case. So again, I have my partition bound. Remind, I, I remind you that this is the additional constraint that I added. So now I've replaced alpha by alpha mu, so the scaled version of mu now. Um, I have less degrees of freedom now because my alpha has to be proportional to mu. Um, to go from the partition bound to the relaxed partition bound, this is the constraint that I added. So, but let's look about let, let's look at this um, this rho positive, whether or not rho has to be positive. Um, I told you that um, beta was proportional to rho, and in my change of variable here, um, if rho is positive, then beta is going to be positive. But in the partition bound, I don't have this constraint that that beta has to be positive. Beta can be positive or negative. So if I just add this constraint that beta is positive, I get what we call the positive partition bound. So I take the partition bound, I, I, I force rho to be positive or beta to be positive, depending on which of the formulations you prefer. Um, and then, you know, we just define for the sake of completing the picture, um, we take the partition bound, we add both additional constraints and I get the weak partition bound, okay? So any guesses as to where the relative discrepancy sits here? W not exactly. It can't be because then it would that would place it underneath of the relaxed partition bound, which would place it underneath the information complexity, and we know that that's not true. So, what's your second guess? <laughs> so, these constraints seem to be quite important. Um, so if we look at the positive partition bound and the weak partition bound, the separation tells us that these two, so, so the, the, the bursting noise function that we heard about yesterday also separates these two because they sh what they showed is that the relative discrepancy is large and the information complexity is small. The information complexity is bigger than this. So we have a separation here, an exponential separation. Right. So something something funny is happening here with this constraint. I wanted to ask. So if rho is can be negative also, positive or negative? Yeah. Is so if rho is allowed to be negative, then it's the partition bound. It's exactly the partition. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting that your separation doesn't use rho um, negative. But you can make it negative. You can make it negative, but it's kind of interesting that you don't because then. You know, we have a little bit more information about where this separation is taking place. For the separation, you only need this. So it's a little bit finer grain. It implies that the partition bound is large, but it's kind of interesting that this is what you use. So this is the picture for the, the distributional case. This is the picture for the non-distributional case. In fact, what happens is, is that these two collapse for the, the non-distributional case. So these two you can show for the non-distributional case that they collapse, which implies that it sits below here, the, the relaxed partition bound. Okay. So, so for me, the interesting thing is to look at you know, what's happening here exactly. So since I'm more than running out of time, let me just um, summarize. So, so what we've given, one of the contributions is that we have a, a linear program formulation which allows us to compare it to the different lower bounds that we're familiar with. Um, we, we now know that this, this uh, relative discrepancy is the partition bound plus the added non-negativity constraint. Um, the, um, we know that when we, we release the distribution mu, then we do get a lower bound on information complexity. So we at the moment, we don't have a separation of non-distributional information complexity and communication complexity. Um, 
and another result which I haven't spoken about. So I think for me, what's most interesting now is to see if we can get another separation, maybe at a higher regime. So the, 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 the talk yesterday, the bursting noise function, the, the separation is for log n versus log log n. So log log n information complexity and log n communication complexity. Can this scale up? Sorry? N is the size of the input, is that correct? It's even worse, log log n versus log 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 n. It's, uh, it's, it's small. There, we're talking about a, a very little, delicate little separation, um, which is not robust to, for example, additive terms. Um, but maybe looking at this weak partition versus positive partition, or the partition versus the relaxed partition, maybe this is a first step that we could do to try to change the regime, because now we're looking at really one constraint of a linear program, maybe by, by focusing our attention on, on the impact of this, this one particular constraint, we'll be able to maybe give a simpler proof, or maybe give a simpler example, or, or one in a higher regime. So the, the open problem is still open. Um, is information complexity equal or different from the communication complexity in the non-distributional bound? Um, but, but also, the question of the partition bound is still open. Is it tight? Is there a separation between complexity, communication complexity, and partition bound? Um, both in both cases, the answer would be interesting. Thank you.